chapter 10. We're looking through this gospel account. Today, looking at uh, true greatness in Christ's kingdom. You've, we've encountered something of this previously. We'll look at it in a few minutes in Mark chapter 9, where the disciples would fuss among themselves as to who is the greatest. Well, it comes up again in this passage today in Mark chapter 10, verses 35 to 45. I want to ask you to stand with me if you would. And as I read the Word of God, you can follow along in your Bibles. If you don't have a Bible, we've got the text on the screen for you. But I'd much rather have you have a Bible. If you don't have one, see us after the service and we'll get you a Bible. Mark 10, 35 to 45. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, what do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. Jesus said to them, you do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink? Or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? And they said to him, we are able. And Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant. But it's for those for whom it has been prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. And Jesus called them to him and said to them, you know that those who were considered rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. And oh, what it will teach us today if we'll submit ourselves to it. And the pitfalls we will avoid if we take our cue of greatness from Jesus and not from our world. Thank you. Please be seated. R.C. Sproul, in commenting on this passage in Mark, says that, that what happens here is that Jesus has been teaching a, uh, what he calls a, a theologia crucis, which is the theology of the cross. And if you look back, that's exactly what he's been teaching. He's told them for three times now. He's going to go to Jerusalem, be handed over, suffer, die, and rise again. But what the disciples are dialed in on in their uh, mistakenness concerning the timing of Messiah is that it would be a theology of glory. That Messiah would come in. And you can, if you take that for a moment and superimpose that on Palm Sunday, what we call Palm Sunday. We talked about that recently. When, when he came riding in on a colt and the people were crying, Hosanna. You, you got to know in the minds of the disciples, they thought, this is it. This is it. It's, it's about to happen. So as Jesus is talking about going to Jerusalem, James and John want to get first dibs at the structure of what they imagine his kingdom will look like. The problem is they, they had the wrong coming in mind. <laughs> this is the first coming. Humility suffering. And the second coming, the great majesty. So we're going to look at this just for a few minutes this morning uh, under four considerations. First, we look at this presumptuous request. And really, I said I was kind saying presumptuous. It was a manipulative request. But this presumptuous request, verses 35 to 37, then, then Jesus' stinging response Verses 38 to 40. Then the cropping up again of jealousy among the twelve. 
And then Jesus teaching a lesson on true greatness, the last few verses there. Look at this presumptuous request. Verse 35, And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. Now let me take a little side trip here a minute. Don't let anybody bind your conscience. Jesus was smarter than that. Didn't let it happen to him. People will say to us sometimes, will you do me a favor? Well, brothers and sisters, we need to know what the favor is before we agree to it. You can say, well, what, what, are, you, what are you wanting? Jesus said that. What do you want? Years ago, when I was pastoring in Louisiana, and I had gone to the Louisiana Baptist Convention, and I, in that setting at the time, I was the editor of a, of a statewide conservative newsletter uh, called The Lifeline. And we had written some things about concerns we had as we were, as we were trying to see if we could put in place uh, a conservative movement that would ultimately vote things through, putting conservative presidents. And we'd had some, we'd begin to have some success in that. And a fellow who was a friend of mine, who happened to be the executive director of the Louisiana Baptist Convention at the time, I was about to speak at the convention. I'm sitting down about the second row. He walks up to me and he says, Bill, I want you to promise me something. So I said, I want you to promise me that you're not going to get upset at anything I say. I said, well, that depends. What are you going to say? Just promise me, he said. And then he went to the platform. And he, uh, he pursued. <laughs> he, he, he skewered me uh, publicly by name, and the newsletter I edited. Um, and it was, it was disconcerting at the time, you know. I was disappointed in him. And I uh, thought, what do I do? I didn't promise him that I would not be angry with him, but I had a, I had a responsibility as a brother in Christ to, to harness my, uh, my attitude. Well, my back, my back, here we go. Something about this space. Well, when he, when he came down, and uh, I didn't have to say a thing. My friends rushed to him and took turns rebuking him. Uh, uh, but you see what he was doing? He was trying to bind my conscience. And I've dealt with people through the years who folks did that to them. So let no one bind your conscience. Look what they say. Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. <laughs> That's presumptuous on so many levels. You're speaking to, to one that you, you believe is the Messiah. Really, the offer ought to be, teacher, tell us what you would have us do. We'll do anything you ask us to do. But they turn it completely around. Now, if you read Matthew's uh, gospel, the mother of James and John come to Jesus. We don't know if this is a separate occasion or if, or if it all happened at one time. When she came to him and wanted him to promise her that her sons would get the left and right, right being the the right hand of authority, and the left being the, the second level of authority there. Grant us to sit, one at your right hand, and one at your left, in your glory. And by the way, I, I think that the two, had, had there been any opportunity for them to do that, the two of them would have fussed about who got the right hand. You know, if you're, if you're thinking that way, about power and prestige, prominence, then you want it all. Uh, someone asked uh, someone one time, what is, the, what is the hardest instrument to play? And the answer was second fiddle. So they asked this presumptuous, outlandish thing. And Jesus gives them a, a stinging response. You do not know what you are asking. See, they thought they, they, thought they knew. They thought... They thought in messianic terms. Jesus kept talking about going to Jerusalem, going to Jerusalem. They seemed to be missing the part where he said, I'm going to suffer 
and die and come, come alive again three days later. That, that was foggy to them, but they got the part down that we're going to Jerusalem, we're going to Jerusalem. And they, they really had the notion that he would, he would unveil himself once and for all. And they wanted to be his chief lieutenants, basking in the glory of their Messiah. And yet he says, you don't, you don't know what you're asking. He uses these two images here that are powerful images. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink? See, he hadn't, he hadn't taken the cup of wrath that he was going to take when he cried out in the garden as we're going to come to that. If it would be possible, let this cup pass from me. He hasn't, he hasn't done that yet. The cup that I drink. Are to be baptized with the baptism with which I'm baptized. Now, I want to be careful here because I like to be charitable to our friends who may disagree with us on the subject of what, what baptism looks like, whether it's sprinkling or whether it's immersion. But I just want to, I want to give you a sample here. I want to substitute some words. Are you able to be sprinkled with the sprinkling with which I'm about to be sprinkled? What if it's, are you able to be immersed in the immersion with which I'm about to be immersed. Folks, he's talking about unspeakable suffering. To be inundated. To be overwhelmed, overcome. So completely, so thoroughly so intensely that he would on the cross cry out, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Now I simply show that to you to say that, and I've told you before, the word, the word baptize is not a translated word. It's a, it's a transliterated word. It's, it's the Greek word baptizo. And unfortunately, in all the, all the translations, it simply comes to us transliterated. No one had the courage to give the meaning of the word, immerse. I'm not being a bigot here, I'm just trying to show you that words have meanings and we don't have the right to change the meaning of a word. Well, he asked them this and they, they answer him, again, superficially, we're able. There's a hymn. I, it was not in our hymnal, but so we didn't sing it today. Are you able, said the Master, to be crucified with me? Well, they spoke right up. We are able. And then Jesus may have surprised them based on what he had said to them, and they did not know what they were talking about, when he says, the cup that I drink, you will drink. Now, not the cup of wrath, but the cup of suffering. Jesus would, as he comes to the cross, empty the cup of God's wrath as he would satisfy divine justice by his suffering and death in our place. He would take upon himself our sins, our guilt, and he would absorb the wrath of God poured out for sin and guilt. He would make the great exchange, his righteousness for our sinfulness. So he's not talking about that to James and John. He uniquely bears the wrath of God effectually for sinners. Otherwise, if he does not bear the wrath of God for someone, then they will endure the wrath of God. Not for a span of a few hours on a cross. They will endure the wrath of God for all of eternity. And so we praise God that our Savior stood in our place, robes us in His righteousness. A work done completely outside of us, outside of our reach, outside of our thoughts, and the gospel comes to us as good news for sinners who have been judged 
worthy of execution. That's what Jesus does. But when he says to James and John, the cup that I drink, you will drink, he is speaking of the suffering that they will endure and will incur for his name's sake. And the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. You, carrying my name, carrying my message, will be immersed in suffering. Now, brothers and sisters, it hasn't come to that for us yet. But it's happening all over the world. To our brothers and sisters in Christ in Malaysia, it's happening. At the hands of ISIS, it is happening to Christians. Genocide is taking place right now in parts of the Middle East and North Africa with the fiendish, devilish murderers hunting down Christians simply because they are Christians. It hasn't come to that here yet. But you don't have to be a rocket scientist to see that it's coming. And no presidential candidate can or should spare us from that. And no Supreme Court ruling can or should take that off of us. Our hope is not in kings and princes. Our hope is in the living God and a crucified Savior who died and rose again for you and for me so that our worst enemy, our worst fear, and that is being killed, dying, Jesus has made a friend of death for us. So he tells them here, you will. Not only do they not know what they've asked, <laughs> they don't know what they've answered. You will suffer. But your main issue, to sit at my right hand or at my left, is not mine to grant. But it is for those for whom it has been prepared. So, so he tells them the seats, the seats are already taken. God has already determined who will sit there. And it won't be you. Well, you know what happens after this. Jealousy breaks out among the twelve again. When the ten heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. Now some of, why? Why were they indignant? Were they indignant that, that they would have the audacity to speak that way to the rabbi? Possibly. Or were they indignant because they didn't get to do it first? Because James and John beat them to the punch? Probably. Look at Mark 9, verses 33 and 34. This happened just a short while before we're here in chapter 10, verse 35 to 45. They came to Capernaum. When he was in the house, he asked them, what were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent. For on the way, they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. Not just James and John, but the others. And it's interesting, they knew it was wrong. Say, so how do you know you know it was wrong? Because they didn't, they didn't want to tell Jesus what they'd been talking about, but he knew anyway. Like children, what did you do? Well, so-and-so didn't know. I didn't ask what so-and-so did. We'll get to so-and-so later. What did you do? They know it's wrong. 
The disciples knew it was wrong. And so we have this history of them <laughs> already discussing who is the greatest, who does Jesus favor. As a good disciple on Sunday nights as we, as we unpack this following Jesus day by day, we're going to see that he, he called 12, but he consistently took three into an inner circle, Peter, James, and John. It would have been easy for them to say, we're his favorites. Clearly, he spends more time with us than he does with you. Well, it's at that point that Jesus teaches the lesson. My, my friend Ernie Reisinger, who's gone to be with the Lord, uh, used to say, say, Bill, experience is a queer teacher. She gives you the test and then the lesson. So they've already failed the test, so it's time to have the lesson. What true greatness is. So he calls them to him, and he said to them, you know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. In other words, you know when you look at the Gentiles, there's a real pecking order there. It wasn't just the Gentiles, by the way, it was the Pharisees as well as the Jews. You could watch and know the pecking order. And those who achieved greatness and authority used it to keep their greatness and authority. To hold everyone back. To be sure that their place was secure. That's lording it over them. There's a mentality like that. It's a, it's a jealous mentality. It doesn't, it doesn't want you to get ahead. Or it's okay if you get ahead just as long as you don't get ahead of them. Someone suggested if, if you've ever watched crabs in a bucket, you can put one crab in a bucket and it'll give it time and it'll try to figure a way to crawl out using those little pictures and put two crabs in a bucket and nobody's getting out. You know why? Because the other crab always grabs the crab that's trying to get out. No matter which one. So he mocks the leadership style of the Gentiles. And it's, it's prominent, it's predominant, it's all around. They see it everywhere they go. And then he says something and it's really interesting. It, the English doesn't capture it here in verse 43. The English says, but it shall not be so among you. But, but here's the Greek of this. And you can feel it. Not so you. This is as, as an intense, holy indignation akin to when he took and made a whip and drove the money changers out of the outer courts, the courts of the Gentiles, where people were supposed to gather to pray for the Gentiles, to pray for the nations. It's the same intensity here. I will not have that on the part of anyone identified with me. Not so you. Stern rebuke. And then he says, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant. That's why we read John 13 together a while ago. Jesus models that for them. He takes the towel. With the crucifixion looming, he knew what was coming. But he's teaching, 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 teaching. So he could pray in John 17, I have finished the work you gave me to do. And he prays that before he gets to the cross. Yes, he was praying that, that 
that which has not happened yet infallibly will happen, but he was also acknowledging and recognizing my teaching of preparation of these is finished. We'll release them now. But here it's not finished. And he will not have it. In fact, he will have just the opposite. You see, the gospel of Jesus Christ turns the world upside down. It turns things on its head. You want to be abundantly blessed? Deny yourself. Well, how can I? Well, deny yourself. You want to live life to the fullest? Take up your cross. Whoever would be great among you must be your servant. It's the lowly slave. It's the household slave. In other words, he's telling them, you know, you want me to spot greatness? Then outserve one another. Can you imagine anybody after Jesus is teaching any of these guys saying, not my job. Can you imagine that? No, I don't do that. True greatness, he says, is ultimate servanthood. And he drives it home again and saying it in a different way, but saying the same thing. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. We talked recently about freedom. Freedom. Freedom is being taken captive by Jesus Christ. He led captivity captive. And he led us to our freedom. And our freedom is to give ourselves devotedly and totally to him as his slaves. We have traded masters. We had a cruel, evil taskmaster who all he wanted from us was to steal, kill, and destroy. And that's all he wants from you today, by the way. And by God's grace and that supernatural, amazing act of love where Jesus gave his life at Calvary and rose from the grave three days later, he bought us. Now I belong to Jesus. Jesus belongs to me. Not for the years of time alone, but for eternity. The, the relationship has changed. Our, we've changed ownership. We're now, we're now owned by one who is not a harsh taskmaster, but who teaches us and models for us everything he expects from us. He's a high priest who is touched with our infirmities. He's been tempted in all ways as we have, yet the difference is he never succumbed to temptation. He never yielded to temptation. But he knows temptation. He sympathizes with you. I've told you before, one of the, there's, a, there's a trilogy of books, The Singer, The Song, and the, the Finale, written by Calvin Miller. And they're, they're a poetic, a prosaic approach to talking about the singer, Jesus, uh, the song, the, the gospel in the book of Acts, and the finale, the revelation. And he writes it, which is powerful imagery. And... In the finale, when he is leaving heaven with his army of champions, there's a believer who's been imprisoned for his faith and beaten for his faith and is dying in his cell. And Calvin Miller brings together these two things where, where the singer comes and rips the roof off of that jail cell. And that what we sang earlier, and can it be, he, he gives a quickening look and the young man comes back to life. 
And the young man looks at him and says, Oh, will I ever have to die again? I, and the singer cuts him off and says, I know what it's like to die. I know. So you see, for us to be great in the kingdom simply involves wholehearted, sold out to servanthood, recognizing that we do not own ourselves, we are owned by somebody, a precious master, a tender master, who doesn't ever ask us to do anything that he himself was not willing to do. But he says in verse 45, one of the most amazing statements in the Scripture, for even the Son of Man, that's his favorite designation of himself, came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. You want to sit on my right hand? You want to sit on my left hand? Give your life. Count your life as nothing except for the excellence of knowing Jesus Christ. Because even the Son of Man did not come. And this is where, this is where he shows them that their notions of Messiah are totally backward. That this Messiah would come the first time to be the suffering servant of Isaiah 53. And that those who would identify with him, Peter says, all who are in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Doesn't say some will. Doesn't say most will. All who have godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution, Peter said. Peter learned this lesson at some point along the way. True greatness manifests itself in humility. And I want to say this. We have in this congregation some of the greatest followers of Christ anyone's ever known. Unassuming, servant hearts, always willing. They don't make a show. They don't stand and give a speech. They don't complain because nobody notices. They simply serve. They serve. And I'm grateful for that. It moves me. And it blesses me when that servant heart beats forth. And, and my fear is, I suppose, that, that the devil will lie to you and tell you, you don't, you don't mean anything here. You don't matter here. And that's a lie from the pit of hell. We would be greatly crippled without your servant hearts. Willing. Ready. To serve. The church is not a mouth only. It's a body. It's hands. It's feet. It's beating hearts of love, tenderness, compassion, service, and servanthood. You see, when you take this verse here and you combine it with what Paul says in Romans chapter 8, where he says, We are heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we might be glorified together with him. When you take that and you combine it here, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. And to give. And here's what you come up with. 
what, what does it look like to be most like Jesus? To be willing to suffer. And until that time, be willing to serve and to give. Serving, giving, and suffering is a wonderful summation of what it means to be Christ-like. And it's Jesus' own definition of it. So what's it mean to be great? It means you're willing to serve. What's it mean to be great? That you recognize that you're not your own. You're a slave. Paul said it this way in 1 Corinthians 7, verse 23. You were bought with a price. I was bought with a price. You know, I, I bump into some Christians, and I'm going to close with it. People who profess to be Christians who act like that the freedom that was purchased for them was a freedom from responsibility, a freedom from things, and a freedom for them to do whatever they wanted to do. But they don't, they don't pass the test of first job. They don't love the brethren. They don't, they don't waste an ounce of energy to be, to be found gathered with the brethren. When the brethren gather, they don't love the brethren. They don't love the Word. It's, it's not a book they read. Much less apply. Their freedom means they can do whatever they want to do. And I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, that is not the freedom that Jesus Christ came to give to us. The freedom He gave to us was the freedom to yoke to Him as His bond servant, as His slave. And that's what Paul, that's how Paul described himself when he wrote the letters to the New Testament. A bond servant of Christ. In other words, not just a servant, a servant who is in the bonds of Christ with no desire to, to graduate from that, but a contentedness to be identified with Christ. You see, I, I believe by God's grace we have a great future because we have great servant hearts here. Not because of the brain trust. Not because of the plans, the programs, the ministries. Those are all right and good and have their place. But, but the servant hearts are like Christ. I thank God for you. I pray that more and more will become like you. That we'll spend our days that we have left seeing how we can outserve the other with the right hearts, right motives, to be sure. But oh, rather than to outdo, rather than to push aside so that we come to be recognized. When we go from this place, Let's remember the words of Jesus Christ, those words he wrote in letters to the seven churches of Asia Minor. I know your works. That can terrify, but, but it shouldn't. It really should satisfy that if no one else knows, Jesus knows. And he looks and he observes and he takes note and says, that's, that's what I'm building that's the church I'm building. Servant hearts. Let's learn greatness from the greatest leader who ever lived. Jesus Christ. And other things we pick up along the way, filter them and say, do they fit this construct? God bless you. Let's pray.